Dr. Michael Dimiuga, and we're going to have a lot of fun. The topic tonight is really going to be fascinating, especially since so many of you are well on your way to your transformation. So, Dr. Mike, I think I hear you in the background. Have you joined us? Yes, I have. I'm sorry. I was flicking through some cards. <laughs> No, no, no. That's wonderful. Well, I tell you what, we don't want to have any um, further delay, and I am very anxious to learn about what you're going to be speaking about tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and let you get started. Thank you so much. And it's interesting. Um, I, was, I was playing catch-up to some um, medical journals, medical reading over this past week, and there was one particular um, title one article that got my attention and so I dove into it and the more I thought about it the more I said to myself you know what this is very very timely and this is actually something that dovetails into our program and is worthy of some exploration so th the first article I'm, I read was my fitness band is making me fat users complain of weight gain with trackers and the next slide shows what a lot of these trackers look like. Um, there are different versions, but they're mostly designed to be worn on the wrist. Some of them are meant to be kept in the pocket. A few of them are designed to slip onto a shoe or actually into a shoe. And th apparently, this is all the rage right now. Um, I'm, I'm kind of old school. I would get into my car and drive off an, a mile. And then I'd say, okay, fine, that's the distance I need to run if I want to run a mile. But apparently this is all the rage. And if you log online, there is a huge amount of guides, um, all kinds of tech guides, uh, consumer publications. Everyone's talking about all the different um, options and advantages and disadvantages of these different devices. And in fact, the next couple of slides show screenshots of a couple of these um, places. So, you know, best fitness trackers of 2014, and yes, there was an article, best fitness trackers of 2013, um, and the next one actually shows, I believe it's from PC World, PC Magazine. So, this is one of those things that seems to cut across a whole segment of individuals all across the market, and, you know, some of them have very interesting names, but the basic issue at heart of the matter is the premise that you go about your daily life activities and this device will track calories burned. And it's interesting how they go about this. They have what are called accelerometers, small devices that measure your movement going forwards or backwards, sideways, and ideally up and down. And those movements are translated into distances. Um, speed, intensity, and then a calculation is made by the um, software and it tells you how many calories you burn. So supposedly there's no need for any special exercises, you just go about your daily activities and it's extremely convenient. You strap it on like you would a watch and you go about your day. And like so many other things today, it links to a smartphone app so that you can actually look at how much distance you've covered, how many calories you've burned, and supposedly it will guide you into making choices, informed choices that will help you stay on track for your weight loss or your fitness goals. Now, I found a great cartoon um, as I was putting this presentation together, and it was the working, the best working definition of calories that I have ever seen. And the next slide shows that calories are tiny little creatures that live in your closet and sew your clothes a little bit tighter every night. <laughs> we, 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 we talk about it a lot. We assume and presume that people know what we're talking about. But really, from, from a practical standpoint, this is what calories do. So the promise, as shown by the next slide, is that if you eat the same or fewer calories, since you create a calorie deficit, you will lose weight. So that's the promise. And it's a fairly simplistic equation. Calories consumed from food, calories burned during physical activity. If everything's exactly in balance, you neither gain nor lose weight. If you tilt one in favor of the other, then however you pay attention to that, you will either gain weight or you will lose weight. And for the longest time, this was, in fact, dogma. We were told this. 
I remember this when I finished up my medical training. Well, you know, the individual's just not burning enough relative to how much they're eating. And so for the next 30 some years, this is what the medical community said. You're just eating too much relative to your physical activity. Your options were either decrease your food intake or increase your physical activity. And I'm sure there's a whole host of folks out there who have heard that over and over again, and they're looking around going, but I'm not. I'm not sitting around doing nothing, and I'm not overeating, and yet I can't get the weight off. So the next slide highlights the fact that, unfortunately, the reality of the situation is a little bit more complicated, just like everything else in life. Weight management is, in fact, multifactorial. It depends on hormonal activity. And by hormonal activity, we're talking about both sex hormones as well as stress hormones. And probably the, the largest group of individuals affected by this are postmenopausal or perimenopausal women. Nothing's really changed in their lifestyle except hormonal balances have shifted. And all of a sudden, everything that used to work for the past 20 or 30 years stops working completely. And, you know, good luck with telling your doctor that it doesn't work anymore. I'm willing to bet the women who've told their doctors this, the doctors are simply looking at them like, you're plumb crazy. We're also talking about stress hormones such as cortisol. You're going through a tough patch. You're a shift worker. Um, and or stressful jobs that produce and overproduce adrenergic hormones, the adrenaline, the adrenaline rush that we talk about. So these are all examples of hormonal activity which will either impede or speed up weight loss. Increasingly recognized also is the amount and quality of sleep. Anyone, anyone who has any disorder of sleep such as nightmares or sleepwalking or sleep apnea will have a problem with weight management simply because the amount of hormones being released during the poor type of sleep packs the weight and especially the fat on. And then there's also the type and timing of food. Um, it's very prevalent in the market today. People are talking about the 5 and 2 diet. People are talking about intermittent fasting. People are talking about eating the bulk of their calories while the sun is up and not eating anything after 4 or 5 o'clock, depending on where they are in the world. And this all has to do with the fact that the type of food that you eat, mostly protein or mostly carbs, and the timing of the food that you eat plays a big role in how your body responds to the food. And so the short version is one size does not fit all. And then we get to the actual equipment. There are in fact programming flaws. Early in the days of computer programming, a, a term, an acronym was created, GIGO, G-I-G-O, and it stands for garbage in, garbage out. The acronym came about because if you program a computer with garbage programming, you will get a garbage readout. In my life as a doctor, I use a version of this when I tell the patient, listen, if you give me incomplete information or if you hold information back, I will make the best wrong diagnosis. And it won't be because I don't know what I'm doing, it's because I'm working off a flawed set of information. So how does this apply to the fitness trackers? There's one tracker on the market that does not respond to vertical movement, which means you could run up and down stairs all day long, and the tracker will say you're staying completely still burning no calories. So, you know, you're still doing what you're supposed to be doing, but it's not reflecting properly. Now, the next slide goes on to an even more important core issue, and that is that all calories are not, in fact, created equal. Now, if you're a physicist, yes, all calories are the same. Whether you're talking about the calories from a plate of broccoli or the calories from a tablespoon of sugar, calories in diesel or calories in gasoline, a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. However, to a biologist, a physiologist, or a nutritionist, the answer is no, because the effect of eating just sugar is clearly not the same as eating the same amount of calories worth of broccoli 
or steak or animal protein or you name it. And the other way that I phrase this is if all calories are the same, if you were a physicist, you would not really plan to shoot a rocket into space with a tank full of broccoli. The broccoli's got calories, but the calorie density is not enough to get the rocket off the launch pad. And the same situation holds true with our bodies. We cannot be talking about calories only. And this last item, the calories in, if it's less than calories burned equals fat loss, that was the oversimplification for so many years. And unfortunately, it, it ignores the glycemic index and the insulin response. The glycemic index, as so many people are aware, is how readily available the sugars are from that food that you consume. So the next slide is simply a cartoon or a graphic that illustrates this point even better. Nobody's going to argue that eating fresh fruits is a very healthy thing to do. Most people would argue that eating a glazed or sprinkled donut is not exactly the best thing you can do for your health. But they do, in fact, have the same number of calories. Even more detail is shown by the next slide. If you ate nuts versus french fries and you ate exactly the same number of calories, if you go down all the different information of that slide, at the end of that process, you would have lost a little over half a pound eating the nuts and you would have gained three and a third pounds eating the french fries. And it has to do with how rapidly the starch is broken down, which then causes a spike in the blood sugar, which then causes insulin, which then makes you hungry, which then makes you eat more. And that is shown in the next slide. This is probably the best representation I have ever seen of how to explain why eating high glycemic foods causes a problem. So that brownish curve represents a high glycemic meal. And we're talking about simple processed carbs, white bread, regular pasta, french fries, sugar. You eat it, your blood sugar skyrockets fairly rapidly. But your body is designed to over-secrete insulin trying to bring that high sugar level back down again. And it does. It brings the sugar level down fairly rapidly, but unfortunately it overshoots the baseline. And then you become hungrier. Which explains, for so many folks, going to a Chinese restaurant is an, is an exercise almost in futility because you can eat a lot and be quite stuffed, but if you ate a lot of white rice, within an hour and a half to two hours, you're hungry again. And it's because of this. Your blood sugar spiked from the white rice, your body overproduced insulin, drove the sugar levels back down again, overshot, and now you're hungry again and you need to eat yet again. Now, the bigger danger there is the amount of insulin being produced skyrockets. Number one, your pancreas are stressed out repeatedly, which means ultimately, given that same thing happening enough times, they will burn out and you will then have the onset of diabetes. Additionally, when you have an oversupply of insulin, what insulin does is it immediately moves the energy, the calories from the blood sugar into the cells and tissues of your body and converts it into the storage form known as fat. So the whole thing is, if you trigger hyperglycemia, an elevated sugar level, you will trigger hyperinsulinemia, an elevated insulin level, which will then trigger fat storage, which you want to avoid at all costs. The next slide shows, when I dug into this subject even more, it was quite heartening to realize that the rest of the medical community is beginning to understand where all of this has been leading to. So this is from WebMD. And basically it says all calories not created equal, study suggests. And I got the screenshot and then I put the slides together. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as I was done with the slides and had submitted them, I came across an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was written by scientists and researchers 
at Harvard Medical School. And they basically said, eating fat is not what makes people fat. In fact, eating fat helps people eat less because they stay full longer. There are a whole host of hormones that keep us from overeating that are only triggered by eating fat. It is eating carbs and especially simple carbs, processed carbs, that's causing the weight epidemic. They also went on to say, and this is groundbreaking because this is the first full endorsement by the medical community, any high protein diet, whether you're talking about the Atkins diet, paleo diet, the early phases of the South Beach diet, any high protein diet will lead to weight loss. So this reverses the dogma that the medical community has been preaching for well over 30 years. Now, so how does this all fit into the program? Because this is a lot of information that we've been talking about all along throughout the entire um, series, and we've been touching on it off and on, off and on, off and on. So skipping over the next slide, because it's just a title slide, how does this fit into my grade 28? If we actually take a look at the slide that discusses how the program progresses, I highlighted items number four and number five. We want you to eat 1,250 calories per day, and you can use MyFitnessPal.com to track the calories, and you can download an app from MyFitnessPal, or actually a better app that I have um, been using recently is Fat Secret. Fat Secret. It's also an app as well as a desktop um, application that you can download, but it helps track the information. We also want you to keep a food diary and write it down. Now, I know, the next slide will almost kind of, sort of, contradict what I just said in the first part. But you said counting calories is not the key, and perhaps you don't like counting calories, and perhaps you don't have a smartphone. Yes, absolutely right, I said counting calories is not the key. But learning how to count calories is part of the education and coaching. It's amazing to me, as a physician, when I ask people, when they come in with their food diaries and I see an, an, an entry that's probably not the best food choice, I start off the conversation by asking them, so, so you ate this, how would you classify that particular food? Was it protein, carbs, or fat? And it's amazing to me how many people cannot accurately describe or classify food, common everyday foods which tells me that there's a huge amount of confusion. People are eating, but they're confused about what it is exactly that they're eating, and hence the coaching and education part of the program. So like every other thing that you learn, I cannot really tell you, hey, listen, I need you to count this, that, and the other thing, and break it down in carbs, fats, and proteins, and you know, I want all of that the first day. Yeah, you're gonna look at me like, yeah, right, not happening, but, if I start you off slowly and ask you to classify the foods, protein, fat, or carbs, that might be for the first two or three days, and so you're getting a sense of what it is that you're eating. Then I ask you to track the calories. So now you're learning how to track calories, and I guarantee you by about the end of the second, possibly the third week, you will take a look at the food that you eat on a daily basis, and you will know intuitively how many calories each of those different foods and each of those different servings have. And then we take you to the next step. And the next slide now shows how this is so important. You, we want you to count the calories, but we want you to progress to counting how many calories are from carbs, protein, and fat. Because this is as much a lesson in learning new habits as it is an exercise in counting calories. And we want you to keep a written food diary in real time if you do not have a smartphone and cannot track the information that way. Please do not think that you'll remember everything you ate at the end of the day and you'll write it down and you'll be able to stay on track. It's not going to happen. Um, it's human nature. We, we eat unconsciously and then, you know, like I don't know where all the calories came from. Keep the written diary in real time. Write it down as you eat every meal. Yes, it's 
a little bit of a bother. Yes, it's something new that you're going to have to learn to do. Yes, it's information that will empower you. But like I said, it is as much a lesson in learning new habits. Once you've figured out how to track the calories intuitively, and you kind of sort of know how to classify food as carbs, protein, or fat, the next step then is to make sure that you're not overeating carbs and that you are in fact eating enough fat and that you are in, a, in fact eating sufficient protein. Because at the end of the day, if you do not track this intake, you will unconsciously slip into the wrong type of food intake, the wrong type of dietary habits, and the next thing you know, you won't be able to stay ahead of the game. Now, this was best exemplified most recently by Joyce, a client that was going through the program. And she resisted, uh, she's a registered nurse by the way, she resisted keeping a food diary for three weeks. Because after all, she's a nurse. She has had the science education and she actually took some nutrition courses back in the day qualifying for her nursing license. But nothing much happened for three weeks. And I kept sitting down and saying, listen, Joyce, I need to see the food diary. Oh, but it's this, it's that, it's whatever. I don't tell them that they're giving me excuses, but she was giving me excuses. I finally got her to understand, listen, if the best way for you is to, for you and I to become friends on my fitness pal and you allow me to look at your diary on a daily basis, I think I can help you better than what we've been doing. Now understand, over the course of three weeks, she perhaps lost two and a half pounds. And she was, frankly, quite ready to quit. So she finally gets the food diary going. The first couple of days, there are no real entries in there. And you know, we just communicate back and forth. I start getting her to flesh out and give more detail in her food diary. She starts tracking the calories. She starts classifying the food as protein, carbs, or fat. And we find out, now she did not do this knowingly. She thought she was eating healthy. She thought she was eating correctly. We find out that although she's not eating a lot of simple processed carbs, she was hardly eating any protein at all. So over the course of two weeks, we simply added protein to her diet. We didn't really have to get rid of too many bad things. We just needed to add protein. A little bit more protein, a little bit more protein, a little bit more protein. So beginning the fourth week, she started to lose weight. She initially only wanted to lose 10 pounds because her issue was really not weight per se. She had had a stroke August of last year, and she understood that if nothing changed in her lifestyle, nothing changed in her biometrics, nothing changed in her physiologic uh, state, she was going to have another stroke within the next five years and likely not survive. So she wanted to lose the weight, but she truly wanted to improve physiologically. She wanted to lose 10 pounds, and after we got the small item of insufficient protein consumption corrected, she went on to lose 25 pounds. This was taken, this was taken Thursday noon at my office. She walked in wearing those pants, and I, uh, you have to understand, this is becoming a regular occurrence in the office. Women walk in, and they literally pull their pants off. But they're wearing other pants under the pants. More importantly, she did not need to unbutton or unzip the pants. She had lost enough weight that it came right off of her. And I said, you know what? I need a picture of this. Now, she just so happened to be wearing that T-shirt, see you at the finish. What's not seen underneath that uh, waistband of the pants is the word line, see you at the finish line. So here's a lady who a year ago had a stroke knew that she needed to do something, but nothing out there seemed to make much sense to her. She came across this program, we started coaching her, she initially resisted me, she started allowing me to help her, she started giving me the information I needed so that I would not be subject to garbage in, garbage out. Proper information led to the proper advice, led to the proper intervention, led to the desired result. All calories are not created equal, we needed to boost her protein intake, and now, this nurse, who a year ago had some difficulty standing and walking and some difficulty talking, is now training for a five-kilometer run. 
She doesn't care about the time that she finishes it. She just wants to do one because she has never been athletic her whole life. So it's interesting how this whole conversation started because her question to me when she walked in was, what do you think about those fitness bands? And I said, you know what? I don't know. I'd have to look them up and see and decide. And that's how this whole segment came about. I am floored because, and you know, I, I have talked to you about these fitness bands. I was getting ready to go get one. I have friends that have them. I see people with them all over the place. And I'm just going to tell you, my friend, and some of them might be listening, but my friends that have them, I haven't seen any change in their body. I haven't seen any big change in what they're doing. And I thought, do they work? I mean, what, what's going on? And so now you've totally answered that for me. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and, and keep on moving forward and, um, yeah, and just keep track of it the old-fashioned way. And one thing I do want to tell you, since you told me to write things down, I am getting far more out of me writing something down rather than keying something in. So I'm still using my phone app, but I actually have a little notebook, and I'm actually writing it down. And it's amazing the physical act of writing it has really, I don't know what it has done to me psychologically, but I am sticking with this better than I ever have before in my life. There's a, there's a consensus out there that the average person today reading the Sunday edition of the New York Times is exposed to more information than somebody would have in their entire lifetime in the 15th century. And the reason I mention that is we have so much information coming up as all the time. The one thing that humans should be able to do really well has been cut out of the equation, and that is to mow the information over. Look at the information and sit down and go, hmm, I wonder what it means. So the physical act of writing Unconsciously, your brain's just been given a, a break, and now your brain's going, hmm, I wonder what it all means. <laughs> well, okay, that makes perfect sense. So now, okay, we have a little teaser for next week, and, and some of you are very much well within your journey. I'm still in my journey. I was in a maintenance program, but now I've ratcheted things up a little bit, but I know for next week's subject, many of you have achieved amazing goals. So you want me to go ahead and move to the next slide? Uh, let me set up the reason why okay. I um, set up this slide. And now I'm talking to the entire field out there. When we send out the invitations to the webinars, we always ask that, you know, keep in touch with your coach, send us your pictures, send us your food diaries, let us know what you think, what you need. And very recently, this, this week, one of the coaches out there said, well, you know, I keep hearing about maintenance programs, but I actually have no idea how to put together a maintenance program. And I said, you know what? I'll bet you there's a whole bunch of people out there with the same concern. So the next slide, we're going to talk about maintenance programs. Now that you've achieved your goal, let's keep you there. And, and I'm going to outline the process that I take and, and this is a very interesting uh, process, both for people who go into the program, customers and clients, as well as for the coaches. Because this will take a lot of the information that you have already learned. It will take the information that the client or the customer is bringing to you, and you will put everything together in a nice, neat little package. Now, the only other teaser I will give is, this is truly the part where there is no standard advice. Every maintenance package is going to be slightly different from everyone else. Just think about this. Everyone's journey to success was different. So keeping you there has got to be different as well. That makes perfect sense to me. I want to thank you so much for being with us tonight, Dr. Mike, and for all of you that joined us. And um, we want to hear from you. Send us your pictures. 
send us your stories. The testimonials are becoming um, incredible, even more incredible than I could ever imagine. And I just want to thank all of you and congratulate all of you on all of your success, everything that you're doing. And uh, Dr. Mike, thank you so much. So we will see you next week with the next Migrate 28. Talk about maintenance. And also send us your questions, because that's what makes the content so fantastic that lets us keep building all of these um, different programs that we're doing. So with that, I say good night. God bless all of you. And we can't wait to hear your next Migrate 28.